Uh, so welcome everybody um, to our, um, our event on tackling design operations. Um, I will just start by introducing myself and then I don't wanna take up too much time um, because we have just an incredible group of panelists um, today from the design world. And this event has been a long time in the planning process because um, public sector designers are very, very busy people. Um, so I wanna uh, I'll introduce myself and our panelists and then uh, we'll, we will get going. Um, so I, um, I'm Hannah Shank. I was one of the early members of the US Digital Service um, and a founding member of the Public Interest Technology Program at New America. Um, I co-authored the book over my shoulder with my colleague Tara McGinnis, um, who was a part of the healthcare.gov team in the White House. Um, she ran the domestic policy team for the Biden transition, um, and she is the founder of the New Practice Lab at New America. Um, so this event today is really twofold. Um, on the one hand, uh, we are lifting up the work around design and government and kind of digging into some of the more unpleasant pieces of it, probably. Um, and we are also here celebrating, um, coming up on the one year anniversary of this book, uh, Power to the Public, which is a blueprint for how governments and nonprofits can harness the power of digital technology to solve public problems. Um, it has been described by President Obama as a good read for anyone who cares about making change happen. Um, so personally, my background is as a designer. I was a private sector designer for a long time. Um, so I am especially excited about this event um, where we'll get to dig into some of the extremely difficult work of bringing design and specifically standing up design operations at all levels of government. Um, so I'm so pleased to introduce our panelists, um, all of whom are people who get up every day and take on public design challenges. Um, we have Mike Land, who is a design leader dedicated to leading and building exemplary user interactions across a range of digital channels, mostly in the civic tech space. Um, as a senior UX designer at the United States Digital Service, he is currently focused on scaling design at the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and Mike is featured in Power to the Public's first chapter on the disastrous launch and then retooling of the nation's immigration system. Um, Mari, Nakano, <laughs> Mari Nakano um, is the design director of the Service Design Studio, which is housed within the New York City Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity. Um, and we profile some of the incredible work that the Service Design Studio has done in New York in power to the public. Um, and finally, we're joined by Sid Harrell, who is a UX researcher and product manager who has helped US city, county, federal, and state agencies unlock the power of technology to serve constituents. Uh, she's worked independently with the Center for Civic Design, Code for America, 18F, and has been a mentor to many people in the field. Um, Sid's work isn't specifically featured in the book, but she's been involved in the background um, of many of the efforts we write about in, in Power to the Public. Um, and she is also the author of her own book about public interest technology, A Civic Technologist's Practice Guide. Um, so I thought today a good way to get started um, is to talk about titles. Uh, so a good barometer, I think, of where the design community's journey of, of the design community's journey over the past few decades is often just the range of titles that we've all had while basically doing the same job. Um, in the private sector, I have been an information architect, a user experience designer, a producer, a UX researcher. Um, in government, I was a digital service expert, services expert. Um, and now I just say I'm a tech person because it's easier. Um, so in government, our titles are complicated, complicated by the fact that there aren't real titles for designers. Um, so you kind of have to make them up. So why don't we do a round robin? Um, what have your titles been? Uh, Sid, you, you kick us off. 
Let's see, when I joined Code for America, it was as a UX evangelist um, for that nonprofit. And then I went to 18F where my official title was innovation specialist, though I acted as a strategy lead. Um, and even when I was chief of staff, I was still an innovation specialist officially. And then in my recent work at the California courts, uh, I have been a senior business systems analyst, always on all those things, a designer. How about you, Mari? Um, so for, uh, in this job, um, I was first titled as a computer systems manager at, to the point where like when I did see an offer to come in for the interview for that, I thought that they had emailed the wrong person and I almost didn't go for the interview because I was really confused. <laughs> Yeah, and then I was also called, um, I'm, I'm now titled the Research Projects Coordinator, um, and I wanted to tell, share something funny. When I was a com computer systems manager, I actually initially also failed the computer systems manager civil service test, because uh, I basically didn't use like the keywords that were really needing to be very, very specific about my responses. So I ended up having to write a five and a half page appeal doc explaining why I believed I was qualified to pass the test, um, even though I had been in the role for some time. Um, so that that's a little bit of my story. And just really glad that a colleague of ours here in the city, Mike Hickey, he, re he recently wrote a great blog post explainer about like the NYC civil service testing process. So definitely go check that out if, if you want some plain language guidance on how to pass the test here. Mike, how about you? So I've been uh, in government uh, just over 19 years now, uh, federal government, uh, and I've been everything from an information technology specialist, which is the 2210 series that everything gets lumped under across government, um, from design to developers to whatever. Um, I've been a public affairs specialist, though I, I will note that I did no public affairs work at all. Uh, that was just my role that they put me underneath as a designer uh, and uh, leading product and things like that. Um, currently a digital services expert, which is what all the USDS folks get kind of pulled in underneath. Um, still not sure what that quite means, but uh, happy to be there and doing the work. Um, and, you know, all the while, like, like Sid mentioned, just been kind of leading design efforts. Uh, so whatever the title, the title doesn't matter, right? Uh, it's the work you do. So to summarize. <laughs> Um, no one knows what our titles are, what our skills are. Maybe we do computer stuff. I don't know. <laughs> um, so let's, I think that's a good, that's a good uh, jumping off point for the rest of this conversation. So um, all three of you have experience, not just doing design work in government, but standing up what are essentially brand new design operations at different, different levels of government. Um, and one of the things that makes this work so hard is that Yes, you can incorporate design thinking and focus and focus on the user into one project, um, but then how do you embed that capacity into government so that it just happens as a part of the process. Um, so we often talk about the way to solve this issue with the phrase design ops, and that is the, free, the title of this um, of this webinar, um, but design ops can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, so we would love to invite the audience um, to Think about what does design ops mean to you and put it into the chat. Um, and we will, can have a conversation about what actually is design ops. Um, and then while you're telling us your thoughts about design ops um, for our panelists to react to, I would love to do something just a little bit different for this um, book talk. So normally we share stories from the book, um, but for this event, I would really love to flip the script a little bit and ask each of you to tell a story. Um, so can you each share a story about a specific design related challenge you faced and what you did to overcome it? Um, so Mari, we have talked about the service design studio in New York as being sort of the, the Cadillac of government design ops. Um, in a way, you've been around for a long time. You've had a lot of time to, um, you know, try and fail and learn. Um, so can you tell us a little bit, uh, just a story about your experience running design in the Big Apple. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you so much. I mean, it's it's really 
flattering to be called a Cadillac. I mean, uh, so I lead a municipal level team of about like six, really six amazing individuals um, who are not all designers um, by trade. And we're part of like a 50, 60 ish member team at the mayor's office for economic opportunity. So, you know, we support a city with a population of about 8.6 million people, 300,000 civil servants across about 135 agencies and offices. And while I know that's really large, um, you know, in itself, I think the scale of my work compared to what Sid and Michael um, are doing at the state and federal levels is, is probably, this is probably much more modest than what you all have to take care of. And there's a lot less cats to herd, I think here in a city. Um, but when we officially launched our studio in 2017, um, you know, one of the first things we had to set out to do was like just getting on people's radar, explaining like what the heck service design is, you know, just like the 101 and really start providing resources and easy to use tools and tips. Um, so, you know, our, I think like, you know, our work is considered kind of wonky because we're not like many of the sort of digital service teams who are able to put out more of these sort of like tangible products um, that people can like really understand and grasp and like see and touch and everything. Um, when we're really out there promoting a methodology and really trying to show how the service design practice could be utilized for just about anything from designing a productive meeting to even like something crazy like co-designing an RFP process or program with community-based orgs. Um, and so we kind of knew that we couldn't just like jump into service design projects with a snap of a finger. And we really needed to spend a lot of time socializing and communicating uh, what, what we do, who the heck we are and like how we're here to support. So over the first year plus or so, we really took the time to set up an ecosystem of service design offerings. And those offerings were like for people to come learn about service design, to try things out with us and to also just like come for really kind of therapeutic vent sessions about the silos and challenges everyone was facing in their own agencies. So we set up um, office hour, an office hour program, which is talked about in the book, uh, where we would be able to like bring in folks from any agency or office to come talk to us one-on-one. -on -one. For an hour, um, we set up, uh, we, we put together what was what's called civic design forums, which is a community of practice. So really trying to de-silo government and inviting people to the table to come learn about service design um, and digital design practices. Um, and, and we also have uh, put out this field guide um, and published this field guide called the tools and tactics. Um, so that was like a little primer that like really people could have like on their desks to take around with them in their bags and just really start to get to know service design in a lightweight, like plain language way that was written uh, for government folks to be able to understand. Um, and with that, we were also offering workshops um, and just like doing mini projects with folks alongside doing larger projects. So we were doing these sort of small, medium, large touch points um, in the beginning. And a lot of times I like really question like, man, we are spending so much time like socializing all of this and like talking about what we do and, you know, are we getting the, but I want to get to work, you know, but I think um, as I really think about it and take that step back, it was totally worth it to spend our first years pushing communication, pushing a brand, you know, a visual brand, um, because at the end of the day, all of this explaining helped us build allyships and camaraderie, like comrades across multiple agencies. So that helped us really get to know the different types of projects that were going on across agencies. And then we could essentially kind of turn into matchmakers where we're like, we heard DHS is doing this and HRA is doing this. You all need to talk to each other um, to, share, to share resources and share tips and stuff like that. Um, I would say within these first few years, I mean, number wise, like we've offered about like 300 office hours now, talking to like 600 public servants at this point, run over a dozen of these civic design forums with over 800 folks, um, and then really have supported around 50 agencies and offices um, in, in the last couple of years. So I think those impact numbers um, we're, we're really proud of and, and we'll continue to keep uh, doing so in this new administration. So. So much of what you said, I just resonate with so much of that. And I am seeing a lot of nodding. Mike and said, do you have, especially the like having to 
do the talking and the selling first before you can do the work is, um, Mike or Sid, do you have thoughts? Well, I really do think it's an interesting contrast to the private sector and even some civic tech rhetoric where there's the idea that we need to act, we need to have a bias toward action, we need to build, we need to get things out there. And when I tell my story in a minute about early stage, you know, there's there's a lot of talking that comes first because we don't have any idea what the thing is when we showed up. <laughs> yeah, same on my end. Um, I, would, I use the word diplomacy a lot because uh, because a lot of it's diplomacy getting out and you know, connecting with folks across the, you know, whether it's an agency or whatever it is, um, and, you know, having those conversations and building relationships. And I think that's an important first step. Um, so, so Mike, we, in our earlier conversation, joked that you're, you're driving the Honda in this scenario. <laughs> um, do you want to, uh, so, so you have been engaged in the um, very difficult work of, uh, bringing design to USCIS, um, which is the, the entity that handles immigration for the um, for our nation. Um, would you, do you have a story that you can um, share about what some of that work has been like? Yeah, so I'd like to think it's a Honda, right? Um, I'm not sure it's so dependable every day. So maybe there's some other cars we might think of there, but um, uh, my story really picks up where at the end of chapter one of your book, um, and that is, uh, you know, we've been engaged at USCIS for since 2014 or so, we meaning uh, U.S. Digital Service, in trying to modernize their process, you know, whether it's integrating Agile or just trying to, you know, think about how human-centered design might fit in the, in the pie there. Um, one of the things we started to figure out after a while was we were having some success, enough success where... Um, you were seeing pockets of design across the enterprise, you know, across the agency. Uh, and the reality became at some point that uh, while there were pockets, they weren't connected in any way. Uh, and so there was this decentralized model of innovation happening where individual teams were working on problem spaces that were very similar across the enterprise, but not being connected in any way and not learning from each other and not, you know, building knowledge. So one day I kind of sat down and wrote a position description for a director role job, you know, just, hey, let's do this, right? I mean, kind of the USDS mentality of just kind of throw something out there and see what happens. Um, we started to kind of carry it up the chain and eventually, uh, and that was about 2018, about you know, end of 2019, they came back to us, management came back to us and said, hey, let's do this thing. Um, but we don't want you involved. We want to have one of you guys run it. And so it just so happens that I end up stepping into the role. And, you know, the role is, you know, very design operations focused, right? A lot of the things we think about in industry, uh, tooling, um, you know, research, trying to figure out how to align research across an enterprise. Uh, the fact that um, there, the lack of culture and coordination, as I mentioned, you know, there, we had design teams that didn't even know the other teams existed, and yet they were working on very similar things. And so the first thing I did was go out and listen to all these different folks. Um, all these, found all the teams. I did kind of a designer safari out there. I had to find these teams across the enterprise. It was interesting. And I kept finding teams and thinking, like, have I found them all? And I'd find one more and be like, oh, there's one more team. Um, but the good thing was, um they very, these folks are very eager to be connected and so it was a matter of just trying to create community and start build a community of practice started to you know create a slack channel for example a team's channel and started to you know connect folks and have community practice meetings uh where they could you know interface with each other and, and you know we had people finding other people like oh i didn't know you work at uscis you know as a designer and you know because they worked in, together in the past so it was really, you know, the design ops portion of it was pretty tried and true for what design ops does. The challenges I think in the government space are, you know, around things like uh, risk aversion, for example, you know, getting designers footing at the table to, to be able to, you know, actually do, you know, do research, for example, and apply that research across, um, you know, and those types of problems are the ones that I think you see more typical government tools, for example, you know, we can't just go out and grab any tool. There's a very long 
really awful, you know, sausage making type process to get tools applied, you know, to get tools procured. Um, and, and, and then contracting, for example, trying to make sure that design is a part of contracting out there and making sure that your know, design uh, is part of the evaluation and even a, an indicator whether a company is actually decent or not. You know, if they have design, you know, there's a lot of folks that know development out there, but not fewer folks know design, fewer companies do. Um, so there are some differences, I think, between traditional design operations, but a lot of what we did focus on was, you know, I, I focused on was trying to build a, you know, design program with all of those different elements. And ultimately, in the end, it was about making designers jobs easier. And that's, that was, you know, my entire goal. Um, and with that, I just want to remind people, so there's an open question, please drop into the chat, your definition of design ops, we are not grading it, there's no right or wrong, it's purely just for the conversation. Um, I think, Mike, that was a great um, summation of what, what may or may not be design ops. Um, so thank you. And I, uh, I all saw a lot of nodding, Mari, and said, do you, do you have things that that sparked? Oh, uh, I have just a lot of uh, empathy and recognition, I think, <laughs> especially on the procurement part, you know, yeah. <laughs> tooling yeah, is hard. You... Uh, getting Ethneo was like a year and a half long process at the courts. <laughs> yeah, and we also talked about like try getting mural approved. We're gonna let's come back to that. Because um, there's definitely, I don't know if it's a, just a therapy session on um, how difficult it is to get these tools or not, but um, I, I want to be sure we get uh, that, so we get to your story. Um, so in this um, terrible vehicular metaphor, we said like, maybe you're the bicycle um, or, you're, you're, or you're, you're on a scooter, I don't know, um, but you are kind of, you're often sort of the first if not the first designer, I would think, like the first foot in the door um, for a lot in a lot of the work that you do. Um, so would you share a story with us? Absolutely. And yeah, that resonates. I like to be first in the door. Um, and <laughs> I like later stages too, but it's fun to go in and sort of discover that there are people in almost every government organization who are facing design decisions and often making really good ones, but they may not identify as designers and be able to kind of bring them this practice in this community. Um, so when I arrived uh, with a partner named Jack Maddens at the California Courts, four years ago um, as embedded consultants, and I, we have just wrapped that in the last month, um, we were asked to work on something called the self-represented litigant portal, which is a lot of syllables. Um, but short version, uh, if you are in a civil case, you are not guaranteed a lawyer. So if you have an eviction or um, an abusive roommate, you need to evict, or you need a restraining order, or you need to deal with child custody, or uh, a divorce, or change your name because you're transitioning, um, the system doesn't provide a lawyer for you. So about 80% of California's court cases have one side or the other that's not represented. And this is obviously really difficult for the people involved in them. It's also difficult for the court system because uh, court is complicated and it's designed from the beginning uh, over centuries of practice for the idea that everybody has a knowledgeable advocate. And so it doesn't do a very good job of accommodating uh, or supporting people without them. Uh, so a committee of judges and lawyers had identified that one thing the system really needed was uh, portal, which uh, some of you will know the quote about how that's a great word for an expensive website um, for people in this situation. And, uh, you know, one of our first questions was, okay, well, what should it do? You know, we don't know. Um, they have, they had websites, they still have them. Um, they have uh, support centers in every court in California that will help self-presented litigants for free if you can get to the courthouse in a pre-pandemic state or if you can find them in a pandemic world. Um, there are legal services corporations that will help people that are means tested um, and also oversubscribed, so often really hard to access to. So there's a clearly space for a digital component in helping people figure out how to do court or actually do court. Um, and so coming in and looking at what's here, um, we're walking into a situation in which there's not a modern CMS, um, there's not a design system, there's not a content practice, 
Um, in fact, one of the more interesting things about the court system, if you've ever dealt with it, is there are these forms that are used for almost every action in the court system. The Judicial Council of California manages about 1,200 standard forms, and they are part of the rules of court capitalized, so they have the force of law, and they don't employ any information designers. So often those things come out difficult for regular members of the public to use, and the web is seen as one way that maybe we can soften that, um, help make it easier for people. Um, but the big question for us was, well, where do we start building this multisyllabic thing uh, when all of these components of what you'd think of as a modern design practice aren't in place? Um, we started with an alpha uh, as good civic tech practice. We found a tiny little bit of legal service that nobody really owned and where we weren't going to run into arguments between the county courts about what the procedure should be. Uh, we thought. Um, and uh, that is the act of serving papers. And so we started out just building some web pages that would be mobile capable and have a design that was clear and step by step um, and shortening the content enormously from the 3000 words about that that existed on the old site. Um, and we did as much as we could to involve people in this. We did a really, we we're really lucky to be given permission to do an extensive research practice and visit 20 of the 58 county courts and spend you know, a day or more at each of them understanding what's the experience of going to court without a lawyer in California. So that's, and even to get there, you know, we had to write a lot of memos on letterhead and <laughs> have the kinds of diplomatic conversations that Mike was talking about. Um, but it turned out that we were able to build something nice and it worked well and people were really interested in why this was better and what we could do about it and gave us permission to move on and start expanding to probably the most common court case type that people do alone, which is divorce. Um, and in getting into the work on that, the thing that became clearer and clearer as we started to build some components of a design system, so we started to work with Drupal instead of um, uh, the older proprietary CMS that they had uh, was that uh, like in so many spaces, content was critical, but we did not have the standing to talk about content. Um, design was not the right place to be talking about that. It had to be talked about by an attorney. Um, and uh, the way attorneys think about content <laughs> is not very aligned with great web practice, especially for a broad public. So uh, I think you know, the way Mike talked about establishing a role and Mari also talked about establishing a role. The role that was so important for us to establish early for design ops to continue existing is called web content attorney. Um, and that's a permanent role for a judicial council staffer who is a person with a law degree and also with web experience. And that made an enormous difference in the kinds of processes that we could have. So now as I and my partner are rolling off and things move on to a new stage, the web content attorney does a lot of the user research as new case types roll onto this portal. Um, she works with the design lead in the web group to make sure studies happen and make sure the right attorneys who have subject matter expertise see those. Um, make sure that testing happens, watch results. So she's almost like a product manager, but the title was chosen to really carefully fit in uh, to the system. And so uh, moving out from just this little act of serving papers, um, we built divorce and then small claims and then eviction restraining orders, parentage or paternity as you might know it. Um, and with each of these, we iterated practice and kind of looped in new sets of people to see how design worked. And so it's still not an enterprise design practice, but it has multiple people who regularly do user research and a lot of people, um, even attorneys and a couple of judges who regularly see user research. Um, and some of those key components uh, of tooling, although not at the highest level in terms of design systems and a more nimble CMS um, and some of the other things that go with that. So that's, that's four years of work <laughs> for a tiny team to kind of get to that stage. So there were two things in there that I want to pull out um, for you guys to, uh, to react to. Um, so one was that you started small. 
Um, and that, that was, I think, a pretty critical first step and it's something we talk about the, in the book. But I'm also curious if um, Mari and Mike, that resonates with like, you're like, yeah, that makes complete sense. I did essentially that or <laughs> in my own scenario or whatever. And then the other um, thing that I think is really interesting is the role of legal. Um, like as a designer, you have to, in, as, a, as a public sector designer, you're working with legal. <laughs> um, I think it's fascinating that you, I had not heard that story um, that you created this sort of hybrid role. Um, I'm wondering, Mari and Mike, if you have had similar experiences or if, so whoever would like to take either of those questions. That's an amazing role, Sid. <laughs> um, I, we don't have like a case like that, I would say, but there, there's something really interesting about this like starting small kind of thing. I mean, partly we, there's no way we could advocate for like, let's just have a big service design team on city staff lines. Like that, that just wasn't gonna fly. So, you know, in the beginning of um, the service design studio, we really leaned a lot on like um, academia actually. So Parsons New School folks, um, we leveraged a lot of their expertise and skill sets to support some of the design pieces when we didn't have enough folks, um, in, you know, capacity inside of government um, to really show what it could, what design could do, um, and and partnered with agencies to like really observe how that process could go down. Um, and then um, a lot of our designers for quite a while were on um, grant funded lines. And so we had to really spend a lot of time building up the case for like why these, these folks should move into staff uh, city tax levy dollar lines. And now, now thankfully, um, all our designers are on staff lines. Um, it used to be like two or three that were on grant and then they're all moved into staff lines. So that's like a big win for us. Um, I think, also, it's something that Sid said too. It's like, you know, it's it's not about always like just looking for other people who have this sort of same pedigree coming in, you know? Um, we definitely are always looking for each other for sure. Um, but I think it's also about like training up folks who are already in government, who are curious and hungry to like tack on a lot of these methodologies and tactics into their work and finding ways to work alongside them so that they can really train up and learn it and do it on their own. Um, so um, in some of our projects, part of our scope of work would be sometimes with an agency to say, hey, we'll go through a service design process together with you all, but we wanna bake in learning and training components so your team can do journey mapping and do interviews by yourself. So we've seen that happen with like, for example, the Administration of Children's Services um, uh, community-based strategies team who we work with for a year. And now they're, they're running a lot of things on their own and just kind of calling us every so often for like a couple tips and tricks kind of thing. Um, but we also see them contracting with um, other design vendors with, without much help or guidance from us at all these days. Um, and, and the other thing is I think uh, with our office hours and civic design forum programs, we, we captured all the names, all the titles, all the frequent flyers that come through these programs and really reached out back to them and said, hey, you know, you are an exemplary like design, we call them design champs. And we would write blog posts about them or really support uplifting the work that they were doing. And a lot of these are staff members who are like mid-level, you know, um, and, and we, we recognize them a lot like in, in our writing and, and everything that we're doing. And now some of them have either moved on to like um, other jobs in design um, or have like moved up in their um, agencies. So uh, it's really great to see that too. Yeah, I'd say both resonate with me. Um, by the way, I love the idea of a, of a uh, web content attorney. I mean, I'm stealing that idea hundred <laughs> percent. So thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, largely what government modernization about right now is digitizing forms, right? I mean, that's 90% of the work at this point is trying to figure out how we can digitize, digitize forms and a large part of that process is, you know, part of its design, but a large part of it's really dealing with, uh, on the government side, on the federal government side, it's legal counsel, uh, it is privacy, uh, and then the, the, the other piece of it is everyone's favorite, Paper Reproduction Act. PRA. PRA, uh, which we're making some headway on, you know, in government right now, there's been 
some memos that have gone out from OIRA, which is, uh, you know, kind of making usability kind of more a part of the picture and things like that. But, you know, all of those things are, you know, I don't want to call them barriers, but they're part of the process, you know, and, you know, as you said, legal counsel is not really, legal counsel and, and plain language don't all, you know, not in the same sentence quite often. Uh, and so um, that's a challenge. On the, on the simplicity side or starting small, I think one of the secret tactics, tactics, and it maybe it's not so secret, uh, or maybe I'm spilling the beans today, is to start with a pilot project. And we all talk about that. It's like, okay, you know, if you come with an idea or something like that, and and and, and folks are reluctant, you know, the risk aversion kind of creeps in. If you call it a pilot, suddenly it becomes magical in some nature, and it's like, oh, yeah, we can do a pilot. Yeah, sure. And so starting small with that kind of pilot project and building upon it. Showing value for one and then building upon it is a critical piece. Can I build on something Mari said? Yes. Um, I wanted to respond to uh, you're talking about your colleagues now hiring design agencies with little support from you. I think that's an underrated component of design competency in these public sector organizations is the ability to really craft a strong design brief and manage an agency and hold a contractor to it. Um, is really, really valuable in these organizations because it's just unusual for them to be able to have the size of design team that might support a private sector uh, company with similar responsibilities. Yeah, I think that goes back to getting more in federal side, it goes back to getting more designers at federal service because then they're able to be there to help interface with you know, procurement folks to you know make sure language is right. They're able to go and be a part of procurement, you know, uh, vetting processes so you can you know be there and understand oh you know this group they get it they don't you know and to be able to support that appropriately so i think that's one of the things we've been trying to do in you know dhs is try to bring more designers and federal designers and put them in the mix because largely right now it's you know the teams are made up of mostly contract designers which is not a bad thing they're doing tremendous work but um you know having more federal designers in the mix is going to be a critical component of modernizing government Um, so, and I will say we're going to get to the um, some of the questions. We have some good questions, um, especially a question on um, career path um, and pipeline to this work that I definitely want to hit on. Um, last call for if you want to say something about what design ops means to you, not getting a lot of uh, traction on that, I think, which is also maybe that just speaks for itself. Um, I think it's complicated, um, but I do want to come back to, um, so we've hit a bunch of times on the need for community and a design community of practice. Um, it came up, I mean, I think Mikey just said like, we're all designing forums. <laughs> um, at USDS, we always joke that we're all, like everybody was on the same project. Um, it's it's a forum redesign. Um, so, uh, but I think Mike, like you're, you're having basically to like go on design safari to to find um, the teams is is uh, is not uncommon. Um, so how have you worked to create design communities? What's what has worked? We'll go first. Mike, why don't you take it? Well, as I mentioned, um, you know that was after going through my and finding community folks and starting to think about like what the picture looks like. Certainly building community was like one of the first steps because, you know, <clears throat> as you're thinking about like how you create a program and how you start to figure out, you know, how do you start to find efficiencies across, especially, um, you start thinking about community, you start thinking about design systems, you start thinking about all these different ways to, to centralize that process. For me, building the community was the first step because I knew there were designers out there I knew they were good. It was just a matter of connecting them for on problem spaces, you know, and starting to have conversations. For me, I, this is natural to me because I come up through user research, but um, finding the right people to observe research sessions and facilitate research sessions uh, was a key part of building that community. Um, but it was also finding who in the system was interacting directly with these underserved users, um, these you know Californians who are trying to get something done in the court system without that status of being a lawyer, um, 
everybody in the judiciary that I have met is mission oriented and smart and amazing. Um, but specifically the people who spend their day to day talking with people who are not professionals in the system um, were I think quickly able to grasp that design itself was a tool that could really help them do what they were trying to do. Um, and you often saw, you know, a lot of, we've created a flyer or we've, we've created an extra form that goes with this that offers some instructions. And yeah, maybe the iconography doesn't look sophisticated to somebody who has a design eye, but there's this impulse happening there um, that's really good. <laughs> and uh, often like the things that are deeper than iconography are doing really good. And so um, kind of co-opting those people and having a little bit of a, a welcome to to Hogwarts moment where it's like, you know what you're doing? You're doing design. There's actually a ton of resources out there in this. <laughs> um, let me show you. Um, I think a lot of examples I've shared are a lot about building community. Um, but one thing I wanted to also add is just like supporting the person in the cubicle next to you kind of mentality. Um, I'm lucky because I get to sit on a larger team, you know, at the at economic opportunity. And so there's a lot of design osmosis that I think goes on just from purely like being present and demonstrating um, ourselves, like in, you know, when we're facilitating conversations, showing clean decks, um, sitting down with someone to like develop an agenda for, you know, a project, um, sharing templates around, uh, you know, project scope, scopes of work, things like that. Um, but also, um, so, so, you know, I, I feel like I've spent a lot of time just becoming really close friends with a lot of people that I work with and sharing my, my kind of practice with them, um, supporting other folks help get their work done, just getting work done, not about necessarily design, just like helping each other out, you know, be more efficient. Um, and I think a lot of that has really um, paid off in a lot of ways, you know, um, and not that I meant, I was never like, oh, I'm going to like do dis design osmosis on this person, but just those pure relationships and building that kind of trust with one another. Now you see folks who are, who feel more empowered or more confident to do these things on their own, who are asking different questions now that aren't like basic one-on-one questions anymore. Um, and like seeing people, seeing people just kind of like run, run the show is like, and, and just being that person that's like, you're doing an amazing job, you know, um, I, I've seen that also be part of this whole community building. Um, so yeah, that's been a like great experience. Yeah, the, the day I, I remember the day where on my Slack channel, it wasn't just me posting questions that folks in the community were posting questions. I was like, all Amazing. right, here we go. Yeah. This, this is getting good here, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was, that was a great day. Yeah. Yeah, and I like just finding little opportunistic tasks to help people with. Yeah. You know, yeah. at some point an attorney came to me and said, hey, we're redesigning this short form and you can't participate. The committee's all lawyers and judges, but you know, I'm just curious, you know how you like cut things up and move them around, which is something I'd done to just show chunks of content. <laughs> what? how would you do that with this form? And I said, oh, I can provide you with some slides privately. <laughs> you know, let me take a couple hours and, and take an IA look at this for you. And then, you know, you can go into that meeting and, and look great and interact with your peers and yeah. I think that's so, I mean, that just sounds so commonplace that like people don't fully know what design is, why we're there, what we do, but they know like, oh, you did a thing. How do, how do I do that thing? Um, so it is a little bit, I think, like the Trojan horse model, right? Of like, I'm going to show you how to do this very small thing that is a very small piece of my skill set, um, and in the hope that you know it will incentivize people to to dig a little deeper. Um, so we um, are going to turn to audience audience questions in a moment. Um, just a reminder that um, power to the public is available with a discount code. Um, which is, I think, believe available to people somewhere. Um, and we also um, have a link to um, Sid's book. So uh, please, if, um, if you like this conversation, um, there's a lot more wisdom in both books. Um, so uh, 
one of the first questions um, that I, I, I want to get to is, how do you do this work? How do you get to do this work? Um, uh, and what, you know, aside from title, so the question is, aside from title, what qualifications are normally required for positions but like yours? I know that um, I think we all probably came through various weird ways um, because these jobs didn't exist uh, <laughs> 10 years ago. Um, any, any advice on, you know, people who are more early career, how to do this work? I think I often say that if you have a technology skill, or in this case, a design skill that is strong enough for you to teach someone else, you're ready to do this work, at least in that skill area. Um, and uh, organizations hiring for this work are usually looking for some experience in the past and some kind of commitment, even if it's not professional, to public sector or civic participation. Um, so if you've been a poll worker or, you know, been on a local um, board or been involved in a community initiative, those are all really good qualifications because uh, in some ways community organizing is one of the models through which this happens. Uh, oh, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I mean, there's, there's ways to get your, feet, your foot in the door. Um, there's also in the general assembly and classes like that where you can start to build skill sets you know um there's also in government there's a new thing called digital core um which uh is a way for folks just out of college or you know folks, folks earlier in their career start to get footing in government you know start to work on uh get hired and work on you know good really tangible product products or pro projects uh within the government space um I think the, the most of most of us, the three of us probably have, you know, we've gone, we're on like our 12th round here, of the boxing match, you know, somewhere along that way, the continuum there. Um, so it takes a while, you know, to tackle the meteor kind of bigger problem spaces, I guess, but there's, there's so much work to be done in government all across all levels that, hey, come join us, really. I encourage folks to, we need people. Um. Oh, go ahead, Marie. No, no I, I mean, definitely plus oneing, like really seeing a mission driven, um, you know, resume, you know, or interview, uh, really hearing folks involved in civic participation is is super key. Like I look at that. I, I think we also really look at, you know, our team focuses a lot on folk, uh, working with low-income New Yorkers who, who have been had pretty traumatic experiences with government. And so, you know, ha looking at lived experience, folks who have been born and raised, you know, in New York City um, and interacted with um, government, uh, th we also really take a lot. We, we take that really seriously, you know, so sharing that kind of story um, has has been really um, important, you know, and, and I know it can be sensitive sometimes to share one story, but um, being able to being able to feel confident that that's that's another part of you that is, you know, um, something of worth and value is is definitely something we look at too. Um. So another question that, um, this is a great question, how do you evaluate, um, measure the progress made by your teams with regard to establishing design ops? Measure, measures of success. Who's nailed this one? Nobody. I mean, I haven't, you know, I haven't nailed it, but we have a few proxies, right? Like, uh, how many people are interested in user research? Um, how quickly can somebody um, put together a draft web page? Um, you know, if we've got our basic design components going and, and people can work on content, um, that means we're a little further forward. Um, and you know, ultimately, we assume that that influences the the metrics for um, how many people say a given page or sequence was helpful. But those are kind of the big ones. Is is you know. Are people interested in users? Um, can they actually use the tools that we have or have made to build something? And how's it working for the public? Yeah, that last one is huge. Um, are we improving services for people? I mean, that's the ultimate measure, right? Is mm -hmm. we, are we improving our services? But I think 
there are, I think one of the challenges internally is that we are, um, you know, design for design sake is not going to work, right? I mean, just because we say it's important. Uh, so you have to tie it to key measures that are important for all the business, basically. And, you know, whether it's mission, you know, meeting mission goals or it's cost savings or, you know, and that's a, some of the things we were working on, you know, we've been working on within DHS is, you know, trying to make that, that, that tie much clearer so that folks that are internal who really pay attention to that stuff say, oh, okay, you can help me, you know, deliver product quicker with less support, you know, and less and, and greater satisfaction among the public you know, that are using whatever form or service or whatever it is. I think those are key. Yeah, I, I think um, one of the things that well, we need to work on this, um, uh, but with our office hours program, for example, we, we track everybody that comes through. So when they sign up, we, we know their position in government, you know, their title, um, we know how, how often they've come in, what agencies they've come from. We mark, uh, you know, what was a specific challenge they came into, came for. Um, did we answer the challenge? Um, did we provide resources? What were those resources? So like, did, did you know, and like, uh, we also look at things like, I think in our first year, more, more people were like, what is service design? Could you sit with us for an hour and like explain that? And now it's like, I need help with a journey map. You know, I need to do a service blueprint, like very much more specific. I need you to look at like a job description or an RFP to make sure that we are putting in the right requirements um, for a, a vendor, you know? Um, and so hearing like that kind of, question asking these days has been really great. Um, but luckily, we've been able to track a lot of the data um, to show at the end how many people have we engaged in and what are they doing with all that information. Um, and that helps us at the end of the day, like make arguments to like OMB around like how, how um, you know, to advocate for more staff lines when they see how many people we're interacting with. So that 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 one's been really helpful and we need to really continue to think about that as well. I think um, also within our first, our second, or actually our first year of like official launch, we also hired an evaluation firm um, to look at this team specifically to see if we were being effective, you know, talking to uh, different agency uh, staff members we had interacted with to get the feels on their impressions of us. And so we got a pretty good, um, I think a lot of people like were really happy with their interactions with us. Um, and so we did that in an early stage and we probably need to consider maybe doing that again pretty soon. Um, so one last question um, from the audience, I, th I think we have time for. Um, so based on where your groups live within your strata of government, um, what structurally helped and hindered your ability to make progress towards your outcomes? Um, so based on where you are in government, pros and cons, who would like to take this one? I'll go big, judicial independence. Um, the heads of courts are judges, uh, and uh, they have court executive officers who help them run it, but the, the ultimate heads are judges, and judges have judicial independence, which extends to administrative independence. So um, uh, basically, I mean, it's a good thing for a lot of reasons, but if you think you want to make a coherent design system across a court system, uh, it is a challenge that offers you more social work to do uh, to get more and more people on board. And you really have to take the tactic of we're going to make something good enough that these people are going to be impressed by it and choose to use it. There's not a way to impose anything. That's a hindrance. Um, I think what helped a little bit structurally in the courts was that there haven't been 10 years of civic technologists telling them what to do. And so we got to be kind of the shiny new toy like happened to civic technologists around 2009, 2010, again in 2018. Um, and uh, knowing a lot more than certainly I did in 2009, 2010. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that structurally helped us. I think the, uh, the hindrance list could be long, <laughs> um, but the, the couple things that come to mind are, uh, the, the siloing of organizations, you know, within government, federal government, especially, 
the folks are kind of, you know, lumped into their spot in government and they're kind of hit, they're, they're stuck within that realm, you know, and what it, what it, the challenge there is from a service design perspective is most government services cross many boundaries and many agencies even. And so, uh, and so folks are tend to be focused on their specific area, but they're right now currently in, across government, there's not a lot of, um, there's probably some energy, but there's just there's not a lot of roles. There's not a lot of you know thought about how we position these design roles at a high enough level that they're able to look across more than one silo, you know. And so you get this these services that are kind of chopped into pieces. Some of them work well because they just have been designed piece by piece. But we're starting to look now at you know how we can look across these services and you know connect digital, physical, human all the way across. Uh, so that's a, that's a piece where, you know, the siloing really kind of has an impact and it's challenging. On the positive side, I think from a USDS perspective, Hani, this probably resonates with you, and that is that we are not in an org chart. <laughs> you know, really, we're kind of independent of that org chart. So we can go in and, um, and work at all levels. You know, we meet with secretary levels all the way down to practitioner level. And so, you know, not having, you know, your place and, you know, being stuck here and here you know, is super helpful. And I think that's one of our superpowers, you know, in terms of USDS is being able to kind of work in that fashion. And then also getting, you know, occasionally when you need help from above, you can get it, you know, and kind of that leverage piece. Um, you don't use it unless you really need to though, because largely, you know, I think operating without it is the best way to go, not having to pull that lever. Um, th this team sits at, at a mayor's office, so we're, we're in a mayor's office. So the pluses around that is like we're pretty high up, um, and so we can put we can be involved in multiple agency projects, which is really nice, and that helps with the desiloing because we're looking um, systemically in that way. Um, I would say also just having that executive level leadership support. Um, from our office um, to just supporting service design writ large has been like super, super helpful to the point now where like the Racial Justice Commission, for example, has brought up our team as a best practice piece and has been inspired to even think like, should we create a more centralized office of like equity and accessibility essentially? And, and it, can service design team be a part of that somehow? You know, so that 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 conversation has been happening um, into this new administration, which is really exciting and terrifying um, all at once. Um, I think also, but the the sort of downsides in that is that um, we might we get mandated though, so we might be on we might be doing work and then suddenly get pulled off and say, sorry, everything you know put the pens down, we need you to go work on this project for the next six months. And so that's very, very jarring for designers, for the whole team. Um, and so that's the part that like can be quite a struggle, um, but we're, we're trying to figure out how to balance um, all of that out, so. Um, I have so many more questions that I wanna ask, but we are, uh, we are at time. So um, I, um, Mari, I wrote down exciting and terrifying because I feel like that um, summarizes a lot of what um, this work is like at all level, no matter what level um, you are in government. Um, and I also just noted um, that I think Mike, you had said there's a lot of social work um, and uh, use the word diplomacy and how often that has come up in this conversation and how critical that is to establishing design ops, whatever that may look like at um, your uh, government entity. Um, so thank you so much um, to our panelists for joining us today.